When people judge parties, they judge them by what they achieve. The problem is that that can be only measured by when you ask yourself, first of all, what the party sought to achieve, and secondly, what the party could expect to achieve. You can't judge them by some abstract standard. Now, if there are any people who expected uh, the party within a few months to have turned into a mass party with thousands of supporters, they will be bitterly disappointed. But of course, that was something that we neither sought, though we would have been pleased about it, nor expected to do. Now, I've been famously, some would say notoriously, sceptical about new parties. Uh, I've always said that they almost invariably fail. The one example that was quoted against that was the BNP itself, which broke away from uh, the NF and eventually supplanted it, but it took a long time. We're talking about 10 years, perhaps, before it did finally overtake it. And it is very difficult if the party goes head-to-head -head against the party from which the current one broke away, or the party that holds the brand name, or perhaps both. And of course that's what happened in one of the seats last time. I think you mentioned that the seat in which we did poorest was one where we decided, after only being formed for three months, to go head to head against the party with the brand name, which I think was a big mistake. There are additional problems, of course, uh, that concern not so much voters, but members. Now, it's no secret that the members of the BMP have gone into several different fragments. Some of those have gone to other parties, uh, I would say, of course, uh, unsuitable other parties. Uh, and once they go to those parties, I think they are unwilling to admit that they've made a mistake. So sometimes they realise that they've made a mistake by going to the parties in question, but it requires them to eat their words to move away, so many of them stay put. But of course most of the people who've left the BMP, and we're talking about about 85% of its membership, most of them have not gone to other parties, which is if anything rather worse, because these people are likely, in some cases at least, to have left British nationalism forever. And the problem there is that as much as they might sympathise with the idea of a successor party, they're not really prepared to invest time and effort yet. We've got to persuade them. In fact, many of them are waiting and looking what other people are going to do. Uh, and they frequently say, well, I think somebody ought to join this party. I think somebody ought to work for this party. Not perhaps ourselves, but somebody else. If there's some other people join, then they'll do the same thing. So that does lead to a certain circular inactivity. <clears throat> We're talking about preparing now. In fact, we originally planned to start in September. So in other words, what we're aiming to do is in a small number of wards, it might be, I don't know, half a dozen throughout the country, might be a bit more, might be a dozen throughout the country, but not really much more than that. What we hope is that we'll get some creditable results from that, so that when the nationalist scene melts down, which it will next May, they won't get any creditable results in the local elections. Are they going to look at us and see a new mass party? No, they're not. But what they will see is a small, credible party getting some creditable results. And then, when it comes to the reassembly, which we will have to have, the people who've gone in the different directions and those who've gone in none have got to come back together again and at the very least start talking to each other. When they do that, I think we'll have a key position because I think if we've put the work in, our results in those May elections will be rather better than theirs. Uh, and this isn't just whistling in the dark. Uh, we saw this with Kevin's election in Loughborough. 
he got 9.4% of the vote, which Heritage and Destiny has said is the best nationalist vote anywhere in the country following the May elections of last year. And that is an important thing to bear in mind, that we already have a degree of credibility. You know, we've been recognised in Heritage and Destiny, some like it, some don't, but it's, it analyses election results scrupulously. The other thing is, of course, the position of UKIP that's been mentioned before. And we all think that sort of UKIP is so far ahead because it's been inflated by the press, and it has. How many times has Nigel Farage, as we ought to call him, I think, rather than his pretentious Farage, uh, how many times has Nigel Farage appeared in question time? More than any other politician. They've been inflated from the beginning. Well, in the particular election, they got 12%, we got 9.5%. In other words, we were within reach of them. If we'd put even extra efforts in there and done some canvassing, we could have overtaken them. What this shows is that UKIP has not got it in the bag. They are leading at the moment with that huge advantage of uh, the press support. But they're not so far ahead that they can't be overtaken. You know, we could possibly have overtaken them there if Kevin had had more support. The one thing that isn't pointed out about UKIP, they're being portrayed at the moment as though they're so far ahead and they're winning everything. In fact, as soon as you start to analyse UKIP, and even some rogue members of the media are starting to do so, how many were they elected with last time at the European elections? 13. How many of those 13 are still with UKIP? Seven. So Nigel Farage has managed to lose nearly half of his contingent in the European Parliament. The point is, to you know, lose one or two MEPs out of 13 is unlucky. <coughs> to lose six, nearly half of them, is incredible. When you start looking at their record in the Parliament, they don't bother to turn up most of the time. Uh, Godfrey Bloom might be regarded as a bit of a folk hero, but his attendance in the plenary, and this is only the once a month do, is 33%. Nutter is not much better than that. When you look at their attendance in committees, they simply don't turn up from one year to the next. Nigel Farage was challenged in the European Parliament uh, by the leader of the Liberals, about the only time that I've ever applauded a Liberal in the European Parliament, uh, was said, how many times did you attend, Mr Farage, in... 2011, not once, you're one committee that you're a member of. How many times did you attend in 2012? And we were in December when he did this, not once. What was Farage's response to that was to resign from his only committee, so he couldn't be accused of not turning up because he was no longer a member of it. Now this is gradually seeping out, but of course the general view of the press is don't say anything that will rock the boat. You know, it's the most clear example of a political party being sustained by the media. So, after the May elections next year, as we say, they'll lose their one MEP uh, and there won't be a replacement for me. Uh, the EDP and the NF will come to nothing. And at that time, it'll be time to sit around a table, very similar to this one perhaps. For all these people have gone in different directions, not to come to that party with any commitment, but to come around, sit around and say, where do we go from here? But it won't be a table with blank pieces of paper on it. We have established ourselves with a constitution that answers all the criticisms that were made of the BNP constitution. You know, the BNP constitution was notoriously authoritarian. Ours is, probably from Griffith's perspective, notoriously democratic. Uh, and also notoriously tolerant of dissent. Uh, there's a safeguard in there that prevents the disciplinary machinery from being used against dissenters. Not only that, we have a statement of policy that uh, is very similar in some respects when it comes to concrete policies to that of the BNP, but it's better articulated 
and it shows an ideological perspective. In other words, it shows the assumptions on the base of it. Of course, some cynics might say, well, he would say that because he did the original draft. Yes, I did the original draft, but in fact, there was a lot of toing and froing. So when we come to that table, there will be a credible constitution and a credible policy statement. So I think that even though I'm not expecting everybody just to flow to us without a second thought, at least I think we will be in the position of being in the default position. In other words, that we'll be the starting point from which a new party will emerge. And we have a team of people at the moment on the steering committee who have a number of qualities. I'll start with John Bean. John Bean can't be here today. He has an invalid wife who needs constant attention. But he's, what I would say, has somebody who has real provenance within the nationalist movement. He was active in the 1950s in the British, uh, in the British nationalist scene. We have seasoned campaigners like Ken Booth. We have BNP founders like Kevin here. We have successful professionals and academics like Adrian Davis, uh, a barrister, Sam Swirling, a solicitor, Kevin Stafford, uh, an architect, and academics, Kevin Scott, won't want to tell you that he got first class honours from a good university, but he did. Uh, you know, it's very easy to get a degree from a university, but to get a first class honours is still uh, an achievement. And Jim Luthwaite, uh, who has a, a doctorate and has lectured in archaeology, though, of course, the political establishment don't allow him to continue to work in that sphere. The one thing I think that could be said, apart from all of those positive features, is one negative feature, or negative in one sense, that these people do not have their own agenda. They're not people who have petty ambitions. None of those people that I've mentioned would like to fight to get to the top position. They would prefer, if somebody more able came along, for that person to do it. So that all these nationalists of merit we mentioned, who've either gone to other parties or they've gone to no party at all, must eventually come back to the fold. And we'll all sit around that table as equals. It won't be our table necessarily, might be a, but we'll certainly have the starting point, the constitution, the policy, the people of merit. Our role won't immediately be as a successor party, but we will be a catalyst, we will be a focal point, and we will be a default position. Thank you.